thank you all for coming today. This is a wonderful event to celebrate the career of our friend and colleague, Sid Altman. I want to give particular thanks to our, our uh, all-star lineup of speakers who have come from around the country and around the world here, and also to Ron Breaker and his staff for, in MCDB for organizing this event. My name is Dan DeMeo. I'm a professor of genetics at Yale. I first met Sid in 1973. I was a uh, Yale College senior with a rather dreary prospect of going to medical school. And I took a course that Sid taught, along with some other junior faculty, Joan Stites and Bill Summers and Charles Ratting, on molecular genetics. And I learned about suppressor tRNAs and nonsense codons, and about messenger RNA and the genetic code, and about bacteriophage lambda. And it uh, literally changed my life. I decided to become a molecular biologist. It's now 40 years later. I'm still doing it. So thank you, Sid, for that. I only talked to Sid once at that time. I went to pick up my final exam. And uh, Sid was in his office, and he was surprised, because I thanked him. And he was surprised, because his students usually came to him only to complain about their grades. So I did think you were a little tough on question four. But other than that, I appreciate that. Um, if you walk down, the, down um, the street to the Yale campus, you'll pass this building that looks like a castle. That's Osborne Memorial Laboratories. And in the archway, there's a little plaque, a bronze plaque, that says this is where Joshua Ladeberg discovered that bacteria can transfer their genes. I haven't seen a plaque like that yet in Klein Biology Tower for Sid, but we need to have one, and we will get one up to recognize Sid and his uh, fantastic discovery that RNA can have enzymatic activity and work for which he has obviously awarded the Nobel Prize in 1989. It's an interesting parallel that when Oswald Avery discovered DNA was the genetic material, everyone spent years trying to prove him wrong and show that protein did the work. And when Sid identified RNA-P, he spent years trying to show that protein did the work uh, before he discovered it was RNA. And so I think perhaps the lesson to that is proteins are overrated, and so it's great that we can recognize that. We all do science for various reasons. Uh, basically, we want to understand how the world works, but it's very unusual that we can make a discovery that really changes how we view life. And that, that's what Sid's experience, experiments were. And so I think Sid really belongs in the pantheon of Yale scientists, along with Lederberg and with uh, Benjamin Silliman, who gave the first lectures in science at Yale, or, or Josiah Willard Gibbs, who discovered thermodynamics or the great paleontologist O.C. Marsh, who discovered Stegosaurus and Triceratops. In fact, if you walk down the street the other direction, you can look at the original bones, not of Marsh or Gibbs, but of <laughs> Triceratops and Stegosaurus. So I know you're eager not to hear me, but to, to talk, hear our distinguished lecturers. And so um, I'd like to just give a couple of ground rules. Please turn off your cell phones and beepers. I will leave mine on so I can beep after half an hour to, to tell people that they should be finishing up. If we have time at the end of each talk, um, we'll have questions. But if not, we'll move on directly, and there'll be plenty of time for questions and private conversations during the breaks. So our first speaker is Matthew Meselson, who's a Dudley Cabot Professor of the National Sciences at Harvard. It's a great title. Uh, I think Matt is known to probably everybody in the room for the famous meselson stahl experiment in 1958 that showed that uh, DNA replication was semi-conservative. Unlike the Republicans, they're not semi-conservative <laughs> anymore. Um, but, but Matt's contributions really extend beyond this single experiment. He discovered messenger RNA three years later. He carried out important discoveries on uh, messenger, on uh, recombination, DNA repair, and restriction enzymes. And during the Vietnam era, he led the charge to make sure that the United States never used biological weapons. So I think we, he deserves uh, quite a bit of credit and thanks for that. In the late 1960s, he had a new postdoctoral fellow, a, a promising young scientist named Sidney Altman. And so I think we can also thank Matt for helping Sid become the scientist that he is. So um, the title of Matt's talk is Sex is Necessary. I chose a title to which there'd be no objection. <laughs> so when I used to visit Yale to talk to Sydney, sometimes I, always, I also talked with another source of wisdom, Evelyn Hutchison. So 
One time I was talking to Evelyn, I think the year before he died, in his lab, still working, but bent over. And uh, with Evelyn, it was very hard to talk for very long because you run out of things to ask him because he knows about everything. But for some reason, I asked him, Evelyn, why do you think sex exists? And he said, well, you must know about the Deloid Rotifers. I never heard of them. This was a long time ago. But I thought it might be interesting to look at these little animals. And so here's what they look like, some of them. There are a few hundred identified morpho species. <coughs> and they have some unusual properties. They were first dis uh, described by Leeuwenhoek in 1724. And he found them by adding water to some of the dry dust from the gutter, rain gutter of his house in Delft and saw that after a while little animals came out of this dry dust. And that's because they survived desiccation, as do very few other animals. They're little complicated little things. They have about the same number of cells as Cena rhabditis elegans, and they have a lot of organs and muscle and even a tiny ganglion. And uh, here's what they look like when they're all dried up. You can keep them for years dried up. And just add water, and they come back to life and can continue reproducing. Before I get into the subject of whether they reproduce sexually or not, I just want to mention some interesting other things about them. They're immensely resistant to radiation as compared with monogonot rotifers, which are a different kind of rotifer which cannot be desiccated, or to C. elegans or to nearly anything. Um, you can put hundreds of double-strand breaks into their genome and they fix them all up. But it's not because the DNA doesn't even get broken at the rate at which it gets broken in radiation-sensitive things. The number of double-strand breaks you get in DNA in anything, bacteria, HeLa cells, is always approximately 0.005 double-strand breaks per megabase of DNA per gray of radiation. It's always the same. In buffer, it's different. The reason it's always the same in things with compact nucleoids or nuclei <coughs> is that what breaks the DNA is hydroxyl radicals and direct Compton interaction of photons with the backbone. <laughs> hydroxyl radicals come from water. In buffer, there's water all over around the DNA, and the short-range hydroxyl radicals made by the radiation can get over to the backbone and break it. But if you compact all the DNA, there's not much water in there. And so the number of the production of hydroxyl radicals is greatly reduced within that volume. And the main cause of breakage is pure physics, Compton scattering. So that's why <laughs> all DNA in nucleoids and nuclei is about equally radiosensitive to, to breakage. The reason why they're so radiation sensitive then is not because their DNA knows how not to get broken. It's because the repair system doesn't get damaged until very high doses. Something is preventing. Now, this is protein carbonylation, which is caused by hydroxyl radicals. Something is preventing the formation of hydroxyl. It could be catalase, because hydroxyl radicals mainly are produced from hydrogen peroxide in this system. But that hasn't been followed up. The reason I mention it is this, this is an interesting system. I'm not going to do it. I tried a little bit to do it, but I'm going to stop teaching pretty soon. Don't tell any deans. Um, but there's old free radical hypothesis for what drives the aging process. So <laughs> this great protection against free radicals is in young deloids. They age just like other things with a death rate that doubles every th three days, the Gompertz rule. And the question would be, when they're really aging, do they still have this protection? If they do, it's one reasonably critical experiment saying that the free radical hypothesis is wrong. The other result doesn't have any firm conclusion. So these are useful animals because of that. Now, they make eggs mitotically. Meiosis has never been observed. Males if they've been observed, have been observed only once in 1932 by a very good 
wrote it for a biologist, but he was so surprised that he found them because even then, in 1932, there was a couple hundred years of people not seeing any males, and it was the only re claim, and they were found in a place where very few people would look, under the ice in a frozen lake in Denmark, where the, the water was teeming with deloid rotifers, and he claims he saw a few males. Other than that, no one's ever seen any males, or at least reported it. So eggs are made and from primary oocytes. You see the oocytes here. Inside an ovary, there are two ovaries. That shows one. And then pretty soon, although it's a different kind of microscopy, uh, the one of these primary oocytes decides to become an egg. And here you see both ovaries, and each one has a developing egg. And then the egg is wiggled out through the rear end of the animal. So they're produced. A paper appeared in 2013, the first genomic sequence, and not a complete sequence, but a lot of scaffolds of a deloid rotifer. And looking at these scaffolds, it's clear that there were no long scaffolds that had homologous copies, which means that there cannot be any homologous chromosome pairs, which you would think would mean that chromosomes can't pair in meiosis. And maybe you would think that, therefore, there can't be any meiosis. Well, they don't teach it anymore, but in old genetics courses, we learned about Enothera, the evening primrose, in which there's 14 chromosomes, seven from each parent, all very nice looking in somatic cells. But in meiosis, they all form one giant ring of 14 chromosomes, tip to tip. And when anaphase happens, all the chromosomes that came from the pollen grain go to one pole, and all the chromosomes that come from the um, ovule go to the other pole. And so you pull apart just what you came in with. The entire haploid genome goes cruising through generation after generation. There's no crossing over, except maybe at the tips. And there may be gene conversion, but no one's done any real sequencing with these very interesting plants. It should be done, but it's not being done. It hasn't been done anyway. So, and the evolution of these is very interesting. It seems that the precursors of these full ring formers were cases in which you do get chromosomes to pair, but only at the tips, as though they don't want to have crossing over. And no synaptonemal conflict, except maybe at the tips. I'll come back to what that could mean. So uh, we wondered, and our work was already in process, if maybe this paper saying that there were no homologous pairs of chromosomes did not necessarily mean there's no meiosis. Maybe there could be evening primrose kind of meiosis. So, and we finished this work and published it in June, and so now I'm going to tell you about that. So we're going to do a test for sex. The test for sex is this. Let's say we have all these people, they're all diploids, and I want to know if you reproduce sexually. So I look at some particular locus. There are two copies, the alleles in each individual. And what if I should find that one individual has uh, alleles A and B, and the other individual has allele C and A, exactly the same A. Well, they must have had a recent common ancestor. Now, with you guys, I know it's not by transmission of DNA fragments like in bacterial transformation. Already I know that must mean that those two people are either brothers or descendants from a very recent cross. If I do this at many different loci, and I find it with these two individuals at every locus, then for sure it's not bacterial transformation, which would be here and there, but not everywhere. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at, a, now we need to look at individuals who belong to the same species. In this room, that's not a problem. But with rotifers, how do you tell what it's the same species? Now, what we found was so surprising, it was done initially by Anna Signorovich, who was a student of Leo Bus here. And she did this kind of experiment with a completely other thing, placozoans. And she got this astonishing result, and I didn't believe it. And she left the lab, and Jay Herr re-isolated all, all the deloids that I'm going to tell you about and repeated the work and got exactly the same result. I still didn't believe it. Well, I believed it, but I knew that the reviewers would hate it. <laughs> and so I asked Eugene Gladyshov, who's now doing amazing things with ripping and nipping, uh, if he would resequence some of the, anyway, all agreed. We re-isolated from single eggs, got the same results as I'm now going to describe. So how do you get a species? Well, one way 
to find things that are closely related and look at their mitochondria. And when you do that, as had been done a, a lot by other people, we didn't look at that many, but we collected delayed rotifers that looked the same under the microscope, and then we sequenced their COX-1 genes and their mitochondria, and they formed clades, and we picked a clade with six individuals in it. Uh, one individual was from Long Island, another from Woods Hole, another from the highway between Woods Hole and Cambridge, one from Harvard Yard, one from Milano, Italy. Now these things, when they're dry, float in the air. And if you put out a dish of water a couple days later, you'll find these little guys. So uh, maybe it came over by air, who knows. But anyway, uh, it's a member of this clade, one from Milano, and then one from the bank of the Charles River, six different isolates. So now what, we're, what we did first was to sequence the same 10 kilobase region in each of these six isolates. And there are two alleles. This is a, you can think of it as like a diploid. It is a diploid for all intents and purposes. So there'll be two copies of this 10 kilobase region, which contains the histone genes and a bunch of other genes. Uh, there'll be two copies of that segment in each animal. And so altogether, there are 12 different sequences here. And this is just a genogram or whatever you call it. And the amazing thing you see here is that one allele from, from Long Island is identical, all 10 KB, to an allele from um, Woods Hole. No difference at all. And here, one allele from the Long Island, again, the Long Island is involved in this, is almost the same as an allele from the Charles River Bank. The only difference is two substitutions near each other, which might be one mutational event because mutations tend to occur in class. Anyway, this is very close allele sharing. So we looked at each of four regions. And in every case, we found the same thing. The one from Long Island has one of its alleles in common with the one from Woods Hole, and its other allele in common with the one from the banks of the Charles River. Well, since these four regions, we believe, are not linked, that's like saying that uh, this is from a cross. It's not from little pieces of DNA independently coming in. And there's a mathematical argument uh, that I could make extremely unlikely there could be independent events. So in colors, two things. First of all, this if you do a cross, here's a simple cross. There, we're looking at one locus, and there are uh, four different alleles here, four colors. And the progeny, there are four kinds of progeny you can get out of it. And you'll notice that each one shares one of its alleles with one other, and its other allele with another other. And that will be true for any one of them. So that pattern, which is what we see, is what you expect for a cross. But more than that, it's the same pattern. The one that shares with two others is always the one from Long Island. That's not expected. Because if there's independent assortment, a la Mendel, then it should be one or the other region that shares with the two others because you've fragmented, you've, you've randomly assorted the different chromosomes, or even more than that, if there's crossing over, you randomly assorted the chunks from the crossovers. So now, I won't drag you through this, but in a factor, in a, a cross between two hybrids, this is the old Punnett square, there are 16 possible progeny, all equally likely, and then we're selecting three individuals from this pool, and we find this funny relationship and the number of different sets of three that you can pull from 16 different kinds of things is that thing with all the factorial signs. And if there are 16 things, this is from a, a cross, just a two-factor uh, cross. There's 16, so there are 816 different ways of pulling three individuals from that group. Uh, if there were uh, three or four independently assorting uh, loci, uh, there would be even more ways, and the bottom line is that it's exceedingly unlikely that we would get this pattern if there was independent assortment. And we could talk about this later, but uh, I'd be wasting time right now. Here's what Enothra, evening primrose, does, as I already mentioned. Sem this chromosomes which look 
all separate in my mitosis, all make this big green ring and diakinesis in um, meiosis. And the gametes that come out are either pure mother or pure father. And so that could explain how you could, by DNA sequencing, not find any pairs of homologous chromosomes because there's all kinds of translocations and stuff. Uh, as I say, no one's done any sequencing, but there are other ways, famous ancient ways of showing that there are lots of translocations. Uh, there are no pairs of homologous chromosomes in these so-called permanent heterozygous plants. That's what evening primrose, and a bunch of other plants that do this too, not just evening primroses. Here it just shows the separate chromosomes nicely in one of these big rings in a different kind of plant, Triscandia. Now, question. There are billions and zillions of Dilaid auriferous out there, including there must be huge numbers of this particular clade out there. We only sampled a few. How is it we were so lucky to find the recent descendants from a cross. And that's why nature and science and current biology all rejected this paper. But then I read a paper by, out of Mike Lynch's lab. In Daphnia, ordinary Daphnia sometimes mates, Daphnia pulex, mates with another kind of a Daphnia. If a female Daphnia mates with the other, pulex mates with that alien other kind of Daphnia, the out come is total sterility. It's called, what's that mar marvelous name? I forget. I'll think of it, very humorous name. Anyway, Mike in his lab wondered, after this infliction of the loss of sex on ordinarily psychically s sexual Daphnia pulex, how long do those completely asexual lineages hang around? And one is thinking of Muller's ratchet, it will take thousands of years and they finally die out. No, they die out within about 20 years. Why? Their hypothesis is this. The population is loaded with deleterious recessive mutations. But that's okay, they're heterozygous. So they're all covered by wild type. Now we turn off sex. But gene conversion happens, it turns out, at a rate much higher, and not just in Daphnia, measured in a different lab, not Mike. And the same has been found in Arabidopsis. See, we didn't know that gene conversion happens so often because if you do ordinary crosses, the markers are so far apart, if there's a little gene conversion inside, you don't see it. It turns out that the frequency of gene conversion in Daphnia, anyway, is such that the chance that a single nucleotide will fall under a conversion track is 100,000 times greater than that site will be mutated by substitution. A huge frequency, the same in Ab Arabidopsis, the same in several other things where good experiments, mutation accumulation experiments have been done. So this is happening at such a fierce rate that it makes your recessive deleterious mutations homozygous, or else it gets rid of them by making them both wild. But half the time, you've become homozygous. So pretty soon you're dead, weaker and weaker, and then you're dead, unless you outcross. So. Now, the delayed rotifers generally don't reproduce sexually, but it's plausible that if they die very soon, if they haven't recently experienced a round of sex, that the majority of the population that's out there have recently experienced a round of sex. So at least that convinced the editors of genetics, and it got published. Now, um, why should they be so weird? What is it about evening primroses and delayed rotifers? Well, human populations in bears and snakes, Mark is telling jokes about snakes, uh, they move around in groups. So you have a big gene pool and you can keep on making different combinations and adapting to changed environment and so on. But delayed rotifers land one and then reproduce asexually and make a monoculture. There's nobody to have sex with except yourself. So there's no point in really having sex. So the same with the evening primrose. It's extremely weedy. A single seed falls into a patch of disturbed vegetation and wow, within a couple of years it's taken over the whole field and then it dies out. So these kinds of individuals with this very strange life history 
are thought, and this is all hand waving, of course, and to need reproductive assurance. That is, the first time out, you've got to make it, or nothing will happen. So that means that if you have a pretty good genome, which is heterozygous, of course, you don't want to start recombining. You've already got a good genome. Don't mess it up. You know, leave it the way it was. So you don't want crossing over. And that might be, as I say, this is hand waving, why we know that with the evening primroses, the earliest ancestors didn't make rings. They had ordinary buildings, except they didn't look ordinary. They looked like discs, pairing only at the tips. In other words, it's like saying, we don't like crossing over, because that would miss up this otherwise highly adapted genome. I'm getting dirty looks, so I'll stop there. But what needs to be done next is full genome sequencing of these particular rotifer isolates, which uh, we'll probably pay some company to do. Uh, but thank you very much. Says sex is necessary, but the talk seemed to say no. What's the we word? need a microphone. You press the button. I didn't say how often. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's different for different. In other words, not okay. Visual. Okay. Secondly, this is just my ignorance, but the evening primrose thing was that it gave off these monsters, right? These odd things. That was what got debris. Monsters? It's a beautiful flower. Yeah, okay. What accounts for that if there's no... What's the current explanation for how those extreme variants pop up if there's no crossing over in the primrose? You're thinking of Hugo de Vries. Yeah. Well, this guy's what else is there to think about? genetics. He knows his <laughs> genetics. Uh, he was studying meiotic drive. Is that right? No. Anyway... Um, the question was, the qu oh, how does it happen? The rings break down once in a while, and all hell breaks loose. Also, there are many different, they're called Renner complexes, complete haploid genomes, and once in, usually selfs. But once in a while, it outcrosses. Has to have sex once in a while to restore heterozygosity, I would say. So by oh, both- Is that true of the rotifers too, do you think? We've never seen them do it. We don't know. All we have is this genetic evidence. I think the reason no one sees males is most people get rotifers either from a monoculture, well, they're not going to bother having sex then. Probably, like monogonot rotifers, you have to have two different strains that produce particular proteins that trigger meiosis in each other. That's known from monogonot rotifers. And the other, uh, uh, I forgot what I was going to say. but. Um, it was interesting, but I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> happens to me all the time. <laughs> oh, uh, yes, why people don't find males. We collect rotifers typically from moss. If you look at moss, there's one diloid sitting here, and one here, and one there. That's not a situation where you expect anything like this pheromone signal. You need a liquid culture where things can diffuse, molecules can diffuse, and a high density, and almost nobody looks at cultures that are likely to have had different species forming a liquid culture at high density. This lake in Denmark in the middle of the winter apparently, or may, if that guy was right, been such a case. The thymine dimer is very uh, structure sensitive. Is it possible that that coiled, twisted DNA uh, takes the, the bases uh, a little further apart from each other so that the uh, thymine dimers are not formed in the radiation? Well, we do know by measurement that the efficiency of double strand breaks is the same in deloid rotifers as it is in everything else. And so if the structure of the DNA is a little different, it doesn't matter to the radiation sensitivity. But it the radiation does, it sensitivity does, it, is the same. But it might ma matter in the formation of the dimer. Formation of, of the dimer between two adjacent thymines. It might matter to various things if it exists, but it doesn't matter to uh, frequency of getting double strand breaks because we measured it. And it's the same as in everything. But else. Is, are double strand breaks the only cause of death? 
a, a, double, a double strand breaks the only cause of lethality in, uh, after the radiation? That's a good question. In the yeast, almost certainly. In bacteria, almost certainly, because you can measure it very easily. In yeast, you have to do it in G1 in haploids, because otherwise you'll get repair. In bacteria, there are no diploids, if you have bacteria with only one nucleus. And so in those systems, it can be easily shown that each break is lethal. It's harder to do with a diploid because it gets repaired. You don't know which breaks stay break, remain breaks. Yes, so the answer is from bacteria and yeast, yes. But otherwise, I, I, I can't say. So uh, sex re re reduces the uh, reproductive capability of the species by a factor of two. It reduces the, the reproductive capability because only half two fold the Twofold cost, yes. Twofold cost. So most of the explanations for why we have sex, uh, if you do it mathematically, quantitatively, they don't come up to a factor right, of two. It's tough sledding. You it's have to tough. overcome a twofold disadvantage. Yeah, anybody done the math on, you know, with the frequency of... of well, there are about 20 different published hypotheses, which actually can be grouped under a few headings, for why sex exists. So this is embarrassing for two reasons. One is it, you have to have a magnitude to overcome the twofold cost of sex and certain other costs, like what if you don't even find a mate, yeah. <laughs> or the cost of finding a mate, or if the mates fight. You know, so, so, uh, or eat each right. other. <laughs> So that's one problem. The other problem is the embarrassment of so many different hypotheses. So it's, Darwin said the reason why it takes two individuals to produce one is yet hidden in darkness, which is a little progress since then. But. I heard on Science Friday, I think it's Ira Plato, that there's very few, perhaps only two or three organisms that enjoy sex. Do you have a comment on that? <laughs> we could take a poll. But, How do you know but the, the poll would be with human beings, and they're among the group that enjoy sex, as I understand it anyway. That's an interesting question. I, I, it's beyond my... <laughs> I th if anyone here has an answer to that, I don't know. I'd like to find the reference to that. You mean they look pained? Well, that's true. DeVore at Harvard, who's an anthropologist, showed us a movie once with lions copulating. And the male lion was looking sort of off like this, uh, not at all pleased. Uh, from what I remember, it was, not only, it. It was uh, not, not, only, not only humans, but giraffes and elephants were two other that enjoy sex. And I find it a little strange, you know, they're difficult given their anatomy. Would you escort this fellow out, please? <laughs>